Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, Mr. President, ministers, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good afternoon. It is a great pleasure to welcome President Mohammed Youssef Almagir. I've been practicing all day. <laughs> Almagrif, the President of the General National Congress of Libya, as our guest today in the IPI Speaker Series. We are truly honored, Mr. President, to have you with us this afternoon, in spite of your very busy schedule. And we are delighted that so many of you in the audience were able to adjust to the last minute time change. The original hour conflicted with the time that the President was to give his General Assembly address, and he graciously agreed last night to accommodate us in setting this new time. First of all, Dr. Al Magrib, I've been practicing all day, and now I can't. Uh, Al Magariaf. Okay. First of all, Dr. Al Magariaf, I would like to congratulate you on your election as president of the General National Congress last month. Dr. Al Magariaf's personal history leading up to his becoming president is an extraordinary one. It is one that throws into dramatic relief the struggle that is the contemporary history of his country. In 1980, after a decade attempting to change the Libyan regime from within, he resigned from his position as ambassador to India and severed ties with Muammar al-Qaddafi. In 1981, he established the main opposition group, the National Front for the Salvation of Libya. His siblings were imprisoned, his house destroyed, and several attempts were made on his life, including the 1989 bombing of an airliner he was thought to be traveling on. 170 passengers died in the resulting crash. He then was to live as a fugitive in exile in the United States for two decades. But during this time, he continued to advocate for democratic reforms, constitutional guarantees, minority rights, and freedom of the press in Libya. It appears now that after so much waiting and suffering, his dreams are finally being realized. During the last two years, Libya has undergone a transformation of historical proportions, though, as we all know, during the past month, it suffered a convulsive outburst of terrorist violence in Benghazi, in which four Americans, including the Ambassador Christopher Stevens, a proven friend of Libya, who the President has just paid tribute to in the General Assembly, were killed. I'm sure the President will discuss that attack, what he thinks was behind it, and the interesting aftermath that we have been witnessing in the streets of Benghazi in recent days. But the overall picture has been one of Libyans inspired by the change taking place in their neighboring countries and exhibiting tremendous courage, escaping the tyranny of Gaddafi, and working hard to restore their country. You'll remember that when the outside world looked upon the Arab awakening and weighed individual countries' chances of creating stable and representative societies, Libya was not given much of a chance. It was dismissed as too tribal, with no infrastructure, no civil society to speak of, and too many militias and too many individuals under arms. Well. This July, Libya successfully held the first free elections since Gaddafi had come to power in 1969, 43 years ago. The General National Congress, which President al Magariev heads, is now preparing to draw up a new constitution that will produce parliamentary elections. It has resumed oil production after it had ground to a standstill during the months of fighting, and today has almost restored output to the level it was before the uprising. There are, of course, serious challenges, many of them, as we learned tragically this month, in the realm of security, 
and more particularly related to two groups, religious extremists and armed militias. We are very lucky to have President al Magariev with us today to share his unique insights on the situation in his country. As a final housekeeping note, may I ask you please to silence your cell phones since we are webcasting this event live. And when we reach the question and answer period, please wait for the microphone after you have been recognized and speak directly into it, keeping it steady the whole time. So once again, Mr. President, it is our honor to welcome you to IPI, and we look forward eagerly to hearing from you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your invitation to us to join you in this forum, to have a dialogue and exchange of views with you in this great city, and at this critical time in the history of my country, Libya. I wish the beginning to present my sincere thanks and appreciation to Mr. Ian Smith, Ian Martin, for the role, I still remember Ian, Ian Martin, for the role he played in Libya on behalf of the United Nations under very difficult circumstances. We have, we have had a very successful visit over the past few days, highlighted by meetings at, the reception, uh, at receptions held by President Obama, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, and bilateral meetings with many distinguished world leaders, of whom I mentioned Madam Secretary Hillary Clinton, British Prime Minister David Cameron, former President Bill Clinton, Senator John McCain, Sec Secretary General of NATO, President of European Council, Executive Director of World Bank, and many others. <coughs> We were heartened by the warm feelings of these world leaders for Libya and its revolution, the expressions of, for support and offers for continued engagement and technical assistance. The Libyan revolution has captured the world, the world imagination since it, it broke out on February 17, 2011, and the world followed with great interest the heroic of the young, young Lib Libyan freedom fighters who came from all walks of life. They fought against overwhelming odds, sacrificed life and limb, and settled for nothing less than victory against the regime that oppressed them for over 42 years. This victory was achieved nearly a year ago. With that, Libya began the hard process of building a true democracy. The process culminated on July the 7th of this year with an election of the General National Congress, an election that all observed testified as free and fully transparent. A new prime minister was elected less than two weeks ago by the Congress to begin the task of forming the first legitimate government in Libya. We have many difficult tasks ahead on the road to security, peace, and democracy. We are fully aware of the difficulties and the dangers we, that we face, both within Libya and from outside. One of the dangers came into, into stark reality on September 11th with the brutal attack on the U.S. mission in Benghazi in which Ambassador Christopher Stevens and three of his colleagues were killed. We mourn the death of the American victims and a number of their Libyan guards who died trying to defend them. 
against overwhelming use of force. We appreciated the measured response of the United States administration. We shared with the American people in this tragic loss because we too lost a great friend of Libya who understood the Libyan cause of freedom and rendered tremendous support for which the Libyan people will always be grateful. <clears throat> we will continue undeterred on the road for real democracy by tackling the security situation which resulted from the power vacuum which resulted after the fall of the oppressive regime, integrating the militias who kept order into the armed forces and central security forces. The strengthening of these military and security forces under central command. The formation of a new government to deal with the security situation and launch a developed plan, a development plan overall overhaul that is deteriorating healthcare and educational systems. Reform the administrative system, the diversity, the oil dependent economy, and provide decent job opportunities for Libyans. In a new Libya, we seek not to revenge, but reconciliation. Not exclu exclusion, but exclusiveness. We will protect civil liberties, human rights, especially for women and minorities. We will fight corruption and poverty, seeking a better standard of living for our people to compensate them for decades of deprivation and need. We will decentralize the government so that it becomes responsive to the needs of all Libyans and communities and for decisions making comes from the base rather than imposed from a certain central authority above. We seek an open economy and transparent system to rebuild our infrastructure, free the private sector to initiate projects and create employment and encourage entrepreneurship. We seek an open economy. Yes. The, Libyan, the new Libya will respect the United Nations Charter, live in peace with its neighbors and the rest of the world community. It will confirm its African identity and engage with its African neighbors. It calls for respect for our human rights and the rights of all people to self-determination. It calls, Stay very close to that microphone. it calls for resolving all borders, conflicts throughout the inter international legal system. It affirms the role of international criminal court and support all international organizations that promote the cause of peace, freedom, liberty, fairness, human rights, and justice. We believe that there can be no true peace in the world unless the human conscience is filled with peace. Human rights are respected and unless there is justice to all peoples and especially for minorities and those living under occupation. Libya has turned new, a, new, a new leaf from being run by a dictatorship that used terrorism and blackmail as instrument of policy dictated by, by the, the whims of a dictator to a country that respects its obligation, obligations under the United Nations Charter calls for genuine peace based on justice, cooperation with other nations of the world for the common interest of the people. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, I don't want to get into a, the kind of conversation that's entered American politics about the attack in Benghazi, but I would like to ask you about it in the context of whether um, this means that Al Qaeda has more of a life in Libya than you thought it did beforehand, and does it still mean you have a problem with militias uh, that, um, that the, the population has been marching against? Uh, 
When uh, the revolution took place on the 7th, 17th of Feb February 2011, many people participated in this revolution. Some of these people who participated in this revolution were uh, some Muslim members of some Muslim groups who were in prison under Gaddafi's regime, and others who came across the borders. They all fought, or we thought, we, they all fought for toppling the regime. And, uh, but we discovered that some of them have their own agenda for new Libya. I mean by this, these groups or this group, those who belong to Al-Qaeda and some other very extreme organizations. <coughs> of course, uh, after the vic achieving the victory, we hope that these uh, these people will reconcile with the rest of the society and uh, f forsake their uh, ideologies or their beliefs. On the contrary, they kept surprising us, surprising Libyans and Libyan government, Libyan authorities, by expressing their, showing their real intentions, which and their agendas which contradict, we discovered that they contradict totally and fundamentally and basically with our aspirations, aspirations with the major, of the majorities of Libyans. We felt we have a problem with these people. We, th we hoped that we, but as time passes, they might, they might change their minds, but they kept making announcement and making met many moves that make majority of, Lib of, Lib of Libyans uneasy, unhappy. Uh, so their slogans, their attacks on, on c certain individuals, uh, abusing certain liberties that they, they, they have, until this incident, uh, very sad incident of, uh, on the 11th of September, which uh, led to the Murdering of uh, Excuse me, the yes. people who are not hearing, that's why I'm, I'm making these motions. I keep, you sorry, have to speak I, very, you have to be very yes, close to this to microphone. This. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> all, people always uh, complain about my, uh, my low voice. Uh, uh, anyhow, until this incident took place and showed the, I mean, displayed to us their ugly, very ugly role, and uh, their challenge, real, real challenge to, to, to authority. And so we are facing now this situation. Luckily enough, they are not great in number. They are small in number. Yes, they have arms, but uh, I think the authorities will be able to handle the situation with, and will, we hope to reach a solution is there a formal disarming dis, um, program in Libya? Now, we are told that so many Libyans have arms. Uh, is there an actual formal government program that you're backing that will take those arms away from those people? And are people relinquishing arms? There are, by the way, uh, there are, I, I think, uh, the demonstration that took place last Friday showed the, where people, uh, Libyan people stand, and it's against these groups. Uh, of course, there are, I mean, uh, unfortunately, one of the results uh, of the revolution was, is uh, having uh, amounts of weapons uh, under the control of many militias and individuals. Uh, the, the previous government, which will end its tenure in uh, very f 
few days, uh, started uh, tackling this problem of uh, particularly, I mean, building the army, new army, uh, security apparatus, collecting arms. But uh, unfortunately, it was engaged with some other, uh, was occupied with many uh, responsibilities, other responsibilities, and didn't give a lot of attention to, to, to this. I think now, after this incident, everyone is aware that, uh, everyone is determined that we should uh, rush to mm -hmm. find a, a solution for, for this problem immediately and uh, a comprehensive one. Is, is there a solution available in turning some of these militia members into properly trained members of formal security? It I mean, is, is that part, the goal? It's this part of the plan. This is part of the plan. Uh, some of them, some others will be given uh, uh, scholarships to train outside and continue their education. Some others will be, will join the government departments. And uh, of course, uh, um, I want to ask you about the democratization of your society. We've watched in particular Tunisia, the route they've gone, Egypt, the route they've gone. Uh, describe to me what the next step is. You have a national congress. I assume there'll be a constituent assembly which will write a constitution. There will be elections. Can you just tell me how that works? This is uh, one of our major uh, functions and tasks as, uh, as a congress is to uh, select or elect don't know yet, select or elect <laughs> constituent assembly, which will draft the, resolu uh, the, the new constitution. It's supposed to be for, uh, formed of six, 60 members. Of, we, ho we hope that will represent all regions of Libya, including women, as a participant in this uh, process. And after drafting the, the new constitution, it will be presented to the people to uh, to say it's say about it whether to adopt it or not after adopting it it will be of course will be implemented and we'll have our uh, general elections and for for a new parliament and for uh, uh, electing a new ruler democratic ruler of libya whether he'll be a king we don't know yet be a king or a president uh, Mr. President, I listened to your speech to the General Assembly, and I wanted to ask you about one aspect of it. You said that there are still the threats, and you said, of Gaddafi's sons yes. and Gaddafi loyalists. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, of course, after being defeated, uh, Gaddafi's, uh, some of Gaddafi's loyal people, uh, some of his tribe, his, some, uh, uh, about four of his sons, uh, relatives and remnants of the old regime managed to escape the country. And unfortunately, they have with them huge amounts of funds. And now most of them are living on uh, countries bordering us in Egypt, Tunisia, Niger, Chad, southern Chad, Algeria. And of course, uh, there are some of them are uh, very active in trying to create problems for, for, for us. So, they, they, so they are, this is another source of threat that we face in uh, these days. But as time passes, I think we'll be, uh, be able with the cooperation from uh, our friends, or our neighbors will uh, we'll put an end, inshallah, to, to this. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I want to go to the floor now. By the way, if any of you uh, want to find out whether uh, uh, Dr. Al Magari is going to be a candidate for president one day, I asked the question and both his wife and his daughter nodded no. So he didn't even have a chance to answer it. Um, please, if you raise your hand, I'll call on you and, and wait for the microphone. Uh, there. Um, I know who you are, Neil, but please identify yourself. Um, Neil McFarker from the New York Times. Um, Mr. President, we've been talking to some leaders in your neighborhood about the problem of extremism in the post-revolutionary period. And uh, a couple of them made three points, and I just wanted to run them by you and, and see what you think. Um, of course, not all Salafis are of the same stripe. They come in a large variety. But some of them just oppose the democratic system. Um, and so a minister near you said that 
Um, he thinks that's going to be sort of the struggle of the next two years as you're trying to s set up is to figure out um, this sort of tension between uh, moderate Islam and extreme Islam. And one of the dilemmas um, that uh, new leaders have talked about is like they don't want to go back to the old system of repression that Mubarak practiced or Ben Ali practiced against um, religious extremists in the country. They have to find a new way to do it, but it, that it's difficult. So I'm wondering how you see th those issues for, for Libya. <coughs> We have, uh, of course, we are a Muslim country. For anyone to express, any Libyan to express religious sentiments, this is very natural. This is what happens everywhere in the world. And uh, if you meet, I mean, if you talk to any majority of Libyans, you will find them. They have two characters characteristics in there. Number one, that they love their country, and so they are nationalists. Number two, they love their religion. This is the combination of, from which the Libyan fabric is made. Unfortunately, there are some Libyans, as a result of the oppression that took place and lasted for 42 years. And as a result of contact with some other Muslim groups that existed somewhere else in, a, in, in an environment which is totally alien to us. It has nothing to do with our aspirations, our, our, the form of Islam that we love and we, we want. This is what led to the existence of these, these two factors that led to the existence of these extremists in Libya. Unfortunately, some of them brought these ideologies or this version of Islam, this extremist, they brought it to us, which is, I can tell you, take from, rejected by the major, extreme majority of Libyans. It's con confined to a very small percentage, a very small, very small group. They brought this version of Islam. They tried to impose it on, on our people. I think uh, we, we are totally different. Lib majority of Libyans are totally different from them. They, we, we long for building a civil s state. They don't believe in that. We long to build a democratic state. They don't believe in that. We long to give freedoms to all Libyans. They don't believe in that. We long to, to empower women. They don't accept that. So there is total difference between them and the majority of Libyans. How long this? This struggle will between these, this, this small percentage of this fragment of Libyans and the majority of Libyans, I think it won't, it won't take that long time. We'll use persuasion, persuasion, we'll try to use persuasion with some of them who are, we, whom we sense that they are willing to, to indulge in, in uh, discourse and uh, conversation. We'll try with them. But there, there are some of them who they make it very clearly, either them or the rest of Libyans. Either they impose their ideas on Libyans or they think they have the right to do anything against them. So this is what, what, what I see happening in, in Libya. I, I don't know how some, some other people think of uh, how they look at uh, what is happening in Libya. I think it, will, uh, it won't take a long time, and Libyans are determined to build their democracy and to build their state and to have their constitution and to have their elections. By the way, they don't believe in elections. They don't believe in constitution. They don't believe in civil state. 
So what choice we are left with? <laughs> I think I'll take two questions at once. First, Ann Phillips in the front row, and then there's a one, in the, exactly that hand in the back row, and then we'll go to some other ones. Two questions at once. Yes? Yes, Mr. President, my name is Ann Phillips. I'm a member of the board of the IPI, and welcome to our organization. Thank you. The fact that you had such a heavy schedule and that you managed to find time for us, we're extremely grateful to you. Honor is so mine. Thank you for coming. Shukran. Shafun. <laughs> Welcome. I have two questions, if I may. Um, going back to what Warren had asked you about arms, first of all, I understand that in addition to all of the arms that were stolen from the government's uh, arsenals during the time of the chaos and revolution, that arms are being smuggled in from Mali and from other jihadists now, at present. And I wonder if that's something that you find that you're going to be able to control. It sounds pretty daunting to me, anyhow. It sounds very daunting. Um, my second question is also about the sons. Now, I know that some of them are out of the country, but safe, I understand, is a prisoner of yours. Now, he was the one, as I understand it, who while his father was in power, who was advocating democracy, at least spoke about democracy. And I met with him once in a group such as this, when he spoke about the future of, of uh, Libya and democracy and democracy, more education and so forth and so on. And of course, then when all of the, the revolution broke out, he very forcefully supported his father. Um, I, I wonder what his future is, whether you know what his future will be there, what what sort of punishment will be meted out, or will, is there any future for him within the new Libya? Thank you, Anne. Thank Keep you that for a second. Again. And there's the gentleman in the back who I recognize, yeah, please, if you would stand, identify yourself. You want yeah. Not a gentleman. <laughs> oh, it's not a gentleman, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it was your hand. <laughs> Just the hair tied back. Uh, dear Hadid from the Associated Press. And you have to speak with the microphone very close to your mouth. Uh, dear Hadid from the Associated Press. Um, I can't hear. Uh, Mr. President, I, I wanted to hear from you um, your, your thoughts on this. This seems to be f a feature of both uh, your neighbors, uh, Tunisia and Egypt, that one of the chief problems is that there's been no method in the past few decades in cracking down on lawless groups without abuses taking place. And in Tunisia's case, they've held back a great deal from cracking down on extremists in their midst, worried about the fact that they don't think they can control their own security services there. Egypt has taken the opposite route by violently cracking down on all perceived opposition through its military courts. I'm wondering if you think this is a problem in the Libyan system as well, in that, if you do decide to crack down on these groups, do you think that security services are prepared or are able to do so in a way that avoids the worst of the abuses that marked the former regime? My second question is, I'm just curious, how many militias have so far been disbanded and how many do you have to go? How many? All right. Four, four questions. The second, second one. Is the second was how many militias have been mm -hmm. disbanded? Mm -hmm. uh, but if you want, the first one was from about arms and the importation arms, from regarding, Mali. And regarding uh, arms, I think there is a lot of arms, in, more than you, you can think of in Libya. The problem is not importing or bringing arms from outside. It's moving them outside Libya to some other countries. This is the problem of the God. But there is a huge arsenal of arms in, yes, and uh, unfortunately some proportion of, uh, good proportion are in the hands of the MPs. And then safe uh, al-Islam. Safe, I think uh, his allegations about democracy, I think, uh, have proved that they were f false immediately after the, that was true face of uh, safe. So uh, as far as his, uh, of course, he will stand the trial, will do our utmost to make sure, to see that it is a fair trial 
after uh, after trial, I think, and uh, pay his dues, he will remain as ordinary citizen of Libya. He will have, he will have total freedom to to enjoy ordinary life. I mean, we, we can. I mean, I can see that. Uh, will prevent him from, from, from doing that. This is new Libya, the new democratic Libya, just Libya, fair Libya. Yes. After he pays, he dues. And then the two questions in the back. One was comparing the Tunisian experience, Egyptian experience, with your own. At the, at, after the revolution. Yes, I think. She means and, and after, after the revolution, after. Right. I mean, steps you're taking right now. Sorry, Esther, if I just want to ask the question, I want to know if you think that Libya has a problem if you can get to stop or put a hand to the different groups, especially the Salafian groups that are in the Libyan society, without the return to the people who were in the previous regime. شفنا بالتجربة التونسية إنه نوعا ما ما عملوا الشيء وقفوا نوعا ما على جنب خوفا من ال من القم نوع من كان عندهم عدم إيمان أو صدق يمكن بال بالأمن اللي كانت موجودة عندهم بالناحية الثانية التجربة المصرية كانت إنه استعملوا المحاكم العسكرية وتجاوزوا إلى يعني لحد كبير بالنسبة للانتهاكات الحقوقية فكنت حابة أعرف كيف بتقيم التجربة الليبية no. هلا. Those, I think for those who for those who use power, I'm talking about the Libyan attitude. I think those who use power or challenge the government who use power, the government has to protect itself, has to deal with them by using power against them. This is a natural right. But those who just confine themselves to just having a different ideas, different opinions, no matter how they are extreme, the government, I think, will, will uh, res uh, I mean, will use with them, uh, try to persuade them to, to, to change their, we have, we use ulamas, we use, uh, uh, religious leaders to try to convince them and change their their ideas, and there were successful uh, successful uh, experience in this field, either in Egypt, in in uh, in Tunisia, and uh, definitely in Libya too. So this will how we this is how we will, will handle situations combination of of of, uh, of uh, measures. And her second question was, how many militias have you disbanded? So far, uh, quite a number, about, I think, uh, not less than 10. Not, not less than 10. But the number is, at our time, uh, time frame is about six months from now. OK. Yes. I have three questions. We'll take three at once. Uh, John Hirsch first, Jeffrey Laurenti, and the woman in the second row. Thank you so much, Mr. President, and all the best to you and your country. Um, I want to follow on Anne's question. You, know, you referred in your remarks to the International Criminal Court. So what role, if any, do you envisage for the International Criminal Court in the trial of Gaddafi's son, Saif, and uh, Mr. Sanusi? the former intelligence chief, who I believe is also now in Libya. Will there be a role for the ICC? Maybe you could clarify that. I think oh. there is a mid I'm sorry, going to take sorry. Two, yes. Yes. three at once. Sure. And then Jeffrey Laurenti. Thank you, John. ICC uh, and <laughs> Jeff Laurenti with the Century Foundation. And this question follows on John's, <laughs> because the, the argument for keeping jurisdiction over SAFE and uh, Sanusi has been uh, that Libya will have its own justice system in place. What of the prior regime's so-called justice system has been salvageable, uh, both in terms of personnel, in terms of a legal profession that is not totally depraved and tainted? Uh, what steps have been taken to create a 
a working judicial system, justice system, and now a stream of consciousness uh, leap uh, on, in terms of justice and payback. Uh, some of your European friends had been for the dictatorship before they were against it. And when it comes to things like oil and other kinds of warm relations, what kinds of memories does the new liberated Libya have for where friends across the Mediterranean had been in the bad old days? I think we'll get to you in a second. So why don't you answer those two? In other words, two of them have to do with ICC, SAFE, Sanusi, and then the final one from Jeffrey Laurenti. Uh, sorry. No, I'm, gonna, I'm holding off, because those two questions were so similar. As You're far next. as I know, uh, I think uh, the I ICC have some kind of understanding with the Libyan government that it is the prerogative of the Libyan government to, to try these, uh, these uh, accused, if I don't say, if not to use criminals. I think... No, we will not. It's not our... It's not our decision. So, uh, it, it, and is Libya going to create its own justice system to take yes. care of people yes. like this Safe is one and of Sanusi? Our, yes, this is one of our priorities now to 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 build or rebuild our judicial system because there is a lot of uh, lot of unfairness in in the in the codes themselves and also in the personnel of. Uh, so rather than send them to the ICC, you will try to seek to try them yourselves. Yes, okay. certainly, certainly. This is. Our and then yes. Jeffrey had, I wouldn't even try to repeat that lyrical question, but uh, the th your second one. Oil. Your friends were for the dictatorship yeah. they were against it. We'll try to forget <laughs> and forgive. It's oh. not selling of oil. <laughs> it's, it's okay. Uh, now we can go. Well, actually, one, oh, I know who you are, uh, and just pass it to when you're through. Um, Shazia Rafi from Parliamentarians for Global Action. Uh, Mr. President, welcome, and uh, we at Parliamentarians for Global Action look forward to when there will be a parliament uh, to recruit uh, members and to work with you in the new constitution process. Um, it seems a lot of the issues that you're dealing with on an urgent basis are the proliferation of arms and armed groups. So at this point, since you are here at the UN, have you asked the UN for assistance um, in uh, demilitarization, demobilization, and rehabilitation? They have done so um, in several post-conflict situations. Or are you trying to do that yourself? Um, and secondly, uh, in July this year, uh, the world tried to get an arms trade treaty to try and bring some regulation on this proliferation of weapons that we face all over. I am originally from Pakistan. Um, and unfortunately, it was torpedoed by a group of nations, um, and we hope to reintroduce this after the elections in the United States so that that is no longer an issue. Uh, when it is brought again to the UN, will Libya sign the ATT? Why don't you answer that? And then Certainly, I'll go to the Libya will one. sign the treaty. Libya will sign the treaty and uh, is expressing full cooperation with the com international community on, on, the, on, on, the, on this issue. Uh, regarding your first question, Libya will be willing to cooperate, to, to, le to, uh, uh, to cooperate with other countries and also to borrow and adopt any, 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 any ideas that can help us in, in solving these issues and problems regarding the arms inside Libya. Uh, I can identify the next question or two you because it's Alaa Murabit who was here this morning on a panel we had on states in transition. She is an extraordinary young Libyan woman. Alaa, you're on stage. Thank you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Shnakhbarak, ya doctor. Amurik tamam, inshallah. As you said, I'm Adam Murabit. Uh, we actually have met before, and you've met Isra at the at Ian Martin's retirement um, or going away party. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm very sorry about that. Um, <laughs> Zaban, I have two questions. Maybe she knows you. something you don't know, yeah. <laughs> 
retirement from Libya. <laughs> um, I have two questions. The first pertains to, you've repeatedly mentioned the inclusion of women um, and the support for women and women's empowerment in Libya, um, particularly under your leadership. My question is, how are you going to ensure that women are included in the Constitution? Will there be affirmative action for the 60 members of the Constitutional Committee? What exactly is the plan? Because as of right now, no one knows. Um, and, and whether or not civil society, particularly women's groups, will also be consulted with the Constitution. Yes. Um, our organization has finished a women's charter, and we are not sure if it will be included. Um, my second question has to do with Omran Shaban, who uh, recently passed away, as you know. Allah um, And it caused a, a, a huge commotion in Libya, and still does, um, because he had been held for 57 days with no real action from the government. Um, and that was something that was, it was very much related to pro and anti-regime tension. So the question there is, how are we going to prevent this in the future? What is the GNC planning on doing? Um, what will the future government do? Is, is there, are there going to be councils, committees? What is the plan? Thank you. Thank you to you. Uh, loaded questions. <laughs> Regarding the first question and uh, empowering women generally, Maybe, I don't know if you know that uh, I have six daughters. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was going to be your answer. <laughs> 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 I have three daughters. Yeah, so <laughs> I have six. So what would you expect my attitude to be? I mean, just for the sake of my daughters, if it's not for any. <laughs> so <laughs> concrete, <laughs> believe, <laughs> believe, believe, yeah. Yes, definitely. We'll, we'll, we'll take whatever me measures needed and necessary to empower women in every way, in every direction, in every sector of our uh, life, starting with the, the, uh, the committee which will draft the Constitution. There will be women there, and the Constitution have to address the rights of women. I, this is my belief, and I will work very hard for, for that. So this is as far as uh, women are concerned. And uh, uh, other question is about this late martyr, Amran Shaban. It's a very sad story. This this guy, this martyr was uh, part he participated in the revolution. He belongs to a family in Mizrata. He was kidnapped by some, some people from Beni Walid, which is neighboring to Mizrata. They kept him in prison. They, they tortured him. In response to plea, pleas from his family, I took the risk myself with number of some members of, 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 the, of the Congress, and I went against the advice of many of my friends and my advisors not to go to Ben Walid. It's too dangerous to go there. I did go there, and they managed to release him, free him. We took him outside Ben Walid and sent him for to receive treatment. Unfortunately, he died. And he, his uh, funeral took place, I think, two days ago. I phoned last night, I phoned his family, myself. And I told them, and I made a statement which was issued that his kidnappers will face trial, and they will be brought to, to justice like many others who really took law in their hands. Not necessarily, they not necessarily belong to a, to a militia, but sometimes for tribal vendetta. So this is the sh short and sad story of, of uh, Lai Chaman. So. I have two questions, Raghida Durham and then the gentleman here. Raghida Durham, Al Haya, Jarid Al Haya, Rahikunala, inshallah, Lika, Besalak Akhtar. Inshallah. Bas, I'll ask in English for the sake of everybody else. So, 
It, it seems to me that the Arab Spring produced in the final analysis an Islamic Spring, as you could see in Egypt, in Tunisia, uh, in your own country. And the question that is really being asked right now, how much will there be a separation of religion and state? Is that, do you personally think that constitution should be religious, Sharia constitution, Sharia based? Uh, because it, it reflects on lots of laws, including regarding women. And how much coordination is there amongst you, um, sort of, you know, the different groups uh, who are referred to as Islamists in power or Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and, and uh, in other places? Do you, especially in the North Africa, obviously, I'm talking about, how much do you coordinate with each other? What sort of relationship do you, what do you talk about when you think of the future of that region? I think I'll just take that question and I'll get to you after this because that's a very good question. No, I'm going to, if you would answer, Raghav. Yes. Uh, talking about coordination and uh, talks and uh, discourse between uh, regimes in Libya, and I don't think they do exist from ideological point of view. They don't exist and will, not partici will never participate in this. But on political level, of course, we will we'll have... It is, it's a must for us. We are neighbors. We we face the same challenges, same, uh, the same uh, future. Uh, regarding uh, constitution, whether it will be based on Sharia or, or uh, it will be sec substitute the secular thing, yes. We, I believe, I will call for a secular constitution. I'll call for that. This is my belief. And there should be a separation between state and, and uh, religion. But do not forget that we are a Muslim society. And if the Constitution have to reflect, as it should reflect, the aspirations, the sentiments, and the culture of the people, it has, the, co the Constitution has, has to have uh, some Islamic uh, uh, sent sentiments. And uh, so, I mean, to, to expect a, a Constitution in a Muslim country to, to adopt any ideas that contradicts with the basic of Islam, mm -hmm. that's, I think, asking for something <coughs> not fair and not right and not proper. Yes. Uh, I'm, I have another question, but I, just, I have one of my own that's so similar to Raghadez, I just want to ask you now. In your speech to the General Assembly, uh, Mr. President, you said you favored a covenant that would criminalize uh, the insulting of religion. Yes. Uh, is it possible to have such a covenant and to also have um, protection of free speech? It is for the United Nations to... to <laughs> <laughs> To try to find find okay. a way, but unfortunately, this is this is the, this is the situation that we have. Now, some people, and under the name of freedom of expression, they allow them, themselves to insult openly prophets or some sacred beliefs, in, not necessarily against Islam, but against any, any religion. These practices which are done by some individuals, and sometimes, excuse me, by saying eccentric, eccentric individuals. Are we willing, are we, is it right, is it proper, that we allow these pe people to stir the sentiments of millions of people that might lead, definitely leads to hate, increase of hatred between nations and peoples. Is it okay? To, is it right to allow these people to, 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 under the name of freedom of expression, to do such things and add to the miseries of the people and create conflict, conflicts and hatreds? This is a question we have to answer. We, all, all, all nations, all countries have to answer this question. 
I mean, take the question of any question. I mean, for example, Holocaust. Holocaust. It's banned. Yes, denying, denying Holocaust is banned in, 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 in some countries. In some countries, yes. That, does this contradict with freedom of, of expression? Some people say yes, but what is the, the good cause that it serves? Yes, it serves good, good cause. I mean, so we, have a ba we should have a balance here. We should have a balance here. And uh, this is the challenge that faces us, that by the same token that we, we allow ourselves to do such a thing for a noble cause, for a good cause, why not do the same thing, apply this same thing to, 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 to attacking or smearing uh, prophets and sacred beliefs? It's not for, for me or for the Libyan people to decide this, but for, this is for the all communities or, or peoples to, to, to decide on that. Gentlemen in the third row. Dr. Mohamed Al-Murabat, I have a question for you. As we, we, we uh, know, there are lots of uh, the old regime elements in neighboring countries. And I would like to know what is the Libyan government doing to uh, either bring them back to justice to face the crimes they committed? What are the uh, modalities to convince Egyptian government, Tunisian government, and other governments to let these people come back to face justice? Because we see that there are lots of steps to strengthen the relations between Libya and our, our neighbors. But I think we have to use this card to bring these people to justice before allowing one million Egyptians to come and work in Libya or Tunisians or Sudanese or wherever. I think we have to put pressure on these governments in order to bring these people to face justice and to minimize the trouble they cause to other to, to Libyan people and to the revolution where thousands of martyrs paid their uh, paid the price in blood. Thank you. Thank you to you. Of course, pressure can always be used but we would rather to have uh, legal, number one, and again, brotherly and, co and cordial relations between us and our brothers. And I think we can, that we will not, yani will, will not find difficulty in convincing them this is not, is not uh, doesn't serve them or uh, serve their benefits to, 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 uh, to harbor these, these criminals and to, uh, carry on uh, doing this. I think we we'll resort first to trying to convince them to do that. But if we have to use pressure, we'll never hesitate to use pressure. Do you have a time frame? Something? How long is the It depends on each case. It depends on each case. It depends on each case. Yes. Thank you. Diplomacy of pressure. Dr. Jafar Jawad uh, from Iraq. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. First of all, I would like to congratulate uh, the Libyan people and government for the freedom and democracy. Thank and you. congratulate Your Excellency for get, gaining the confidence of uh, Libyan people. Thank you. Uh, Your Excellency, I have uh, two questions. The first question is uh, recently we saw that uh, the recent Libyan government very soft and hesitant with the radical and extremist group in Libya who start taking control in many places and start to destroying and bombing the shrine and the graves of saints. At the same time, same government, very active and doing redoubled and repeated efforts to release and free the Libyan terrorists who are uh, 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 arrested in Iraq. So how you explain that? And my second question is, during the Libyan war, we witnessed a new coordination and collaboration between NATO and former leader of Al-Qaeda. I don't want to mention names, but you know the Prince of Tripoli. How you, from your point of view, how you explain that? Thank you very much. First of all, regarding uh the practice of these uh, extremists against the shrines and that uh, again this is uh, 
this was rejected by 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 uh, majority of Libyans. It's against their sentiments, and uh, these shrines have uh, existed for hundreds of years, and people uh, never never felt that uh, they uh, they offend their beliefs, religious beliefs. On the contrary, they consider just part of their culture and part of their part of their uh, beliefs and sentiments. Unfortunately, this was the first test that uh, that took place in uh, the last few months. That uh, when they started uh, <clears throat> attacking these shrines, people, s some people tolerated that, said, okay, let them go with this. But this is what encouraged them. This is what encouraged them to carry on their uh, I mean, executing their uh, agenda. And I think this is what, what, what led to other, I mean, trouble that we, we saw afterwards. So uh, again, we have to, we have to find, uh, a so, I mean, def decide what to do with these people. We have to, we have to uh, stop, at the, stop them at a certain point, otherwise they will never stop. Uh, Exceeding the limits of of, uh, of law and of, uh, so this is a uh, number. Regarding the second question, is not for me to to answer. It's for the people who took the decision. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, they did some good job. These people did some good job, and by, <laughs> but, uh, and I know some of them really changed, really changed. They changed their ideology, their attitude, their, and become part of the new fabric of new Libya. New Libya. Yes. A uh, gentleman in the navy blue suit in the back of the wall. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Is that okay? Um, Jose from the um, Department of Peacekeeping, UN. Um, thank you for having us. Um, I have a question. You find yourself in a transitional period right now, and <clears throat> you're about to sit down to draft and write a constitution and approve a constitution, hopefully. My question is, do you think there is consensus regarding what system of government is to be implemented in Libya, um, and whether you have any particular system of governments that you prefer? And by system of governments, I would be referring to whether you would like to centralize um, the government or have a decentralized federal system with, for example, power sharing guarantees, um, do you think that would promote democratic stability? Thank you. Thank you. Can you answer that? Yes, I think uh, there is an agreement among uh, all Libyans that, or 99% of Libyans, <laughs> that they want a democratic government, democratic system, number one. Number two, decentralized system. Some go to the extent of asking for federalism. Some just are, are confined with the idea of just having a decentralized system because they suffered a lot under centralized system. Uh, Abdullah Al Saidi. Uh, Abdullah Al Saidi, and uh, I am from Yemen. <clears throat> and Mr. President, Allow me, I know you are a man of democracy. Allow me to disagree with you on this question of the film and incitement to hatred. There is a UN resolution, by the way, that the Arab world will be, do better to, to cite the UN Security Council on incitement of hatred. That is better than to say that we have to have laws to ban uh, uh, disdain of religions. You know, this is not going to happen because the Fourth Amend Amendment to the US Constitution will not be amended, nor will Europe accept because this is part of their heretic from the Enlightenment. I think we make a mistake in the Arab and Islamic world. We, we overreact. We became too passionate about things. And then we draw attention to a, a, a film that doesn't deserve 
much respect because it's not historic. The, the role of the, of, the, of the video was only to, to uh, put down Prophet Muhammad. But then we, we, we allowed everyone to look and see this film. What is it? I think we will do better to react with a degree of rationalism rather than with passion. This is one. I have two questions for you, Mr. President. <laughs> the question, the first question, I think there is something in common between Yemen and between? Libya. But in Libya, I don't think it is that serious. This separatist tendency in the East, uh, in, East uh, in the East in Libya, and, my se and I want you to comment on that. And the second thing is. What's the, sorry, I didn't get this. Separatism. Separatist. Oh. Yeah. And the second thing, Libya is being blackmailed by the militia. And I was fascinated by the question, how many militia did you disband? And you said, and you said 10. So you far. So far. You probably have hundreds of them. What, what, what is your plan for a national army? Because without a national army, Libya will not be able to overcome its difficulties. Thank you. Talking about reacting to what, what happens in a passionate, in emotional way, what can we do to the masses? I agree with you that our Reaction should be balanced one, sensible one. But what, we, what can we do with the masses? Masses, millions and millions, hundreds of millions of Muslims who can only react, can only react in a passionate way. So what can you do to them? It is them who will stir hatred, who feel injured and react in ugly and violent ways sometimes. So maybe it is, I agree with you what, what you said, but again, on the other side, we can, we, if we can stop, stop these practices, or I don't know how, to, how, to, how we, we can do it, how can we, we, we can do it. But I put the blame on, for example, after what happened in, on the 11th of September in Benghazi and Two days later, some journalists published in French papers or republished some. Is this, I mean, can't you sense that someone is deliberately trying to stir the problems? Has this to, anything to do with the freedom of express? No, there are some people who are deliberately trying to create problems. I'm talking about these people. I mean, is there, do we, can we do anything about, about this? Can we, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's for, this is a challenge that faces, that we all face. Uh, regarding uh, military, yes. Uh, our uh, we have a comprehensive plan to deal with to deal with the situation security situation in Libya. Number one is to rebuild our national army. Number two is to rebuild our security apparatus. Number three is put a plan for controlling arms. Number four to work on. Uh, reforming the judicial system, number four, is to work hardly on national reconciliation. These files are linked together, and through handling them, at, we hope within a reasonable, reasonable time, we can tackle these problems that we, that we, that we, face, we are facing now. What is the, there is? A, oh, separatists. I think, uh, I don't, th yes, there are some who, are some people in, in, the, in the eastern region, region of Libya who, calling, who are calling for federalism, not separatism. 
but uh, as we have this, we have uh, again a greater number who are against this in the east. So I don't know if you if you can say that the east, the whole east is uh, is uh, for cessation. Did you have another question? Oh, I think you have much time. Uh, do I see any more hands? Any more questions? We're getting close to the time. Oh, very good. Over here inside. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome you and congratulations you. for being the new president. Yeah. Please identify um, yourself. My name is Sawa Kader, and I represent the U.S. Federation for Middle East Peace. I, um, I have been to Libya. I had the privilege to go there, and I did notice that at the time that we were there, as beautiful as a country as it is, especially the shore and, and the ruins, and because I'm into archaeology. And it is, as I had seen then, it was untapped, was beautiful, pure virgin sites and beaches. Um, about the, the, um, the question with the people of Libya, it's going to take a long time, because what I saw was, was that fear. They've never been able to do decision making on themselves, by themselves because they've been ruled for so many years. So you, I think your, your next step maybe is to slowly democratize them. Um, I don't know. But for the issue about women and about the religion, we have to educate the masses. We really do have to educate. Because whoever did this knew what button to push. And that religious button is very ready, and it's always there. So it is our freedom, of course, of speech. But when I am infringing on you, then it becomes not a freedom. As long as we respect each other, and these people, they really oh, don't know. Only they will see one is going, and they follow. So there has to be some sort of a line there, you know, yes, between yes. sensitivity to a, to a religious or cultural and a freedom of a speech. And I wish you all the luck, and I would like to know also, do you, are you going to use a quota for women? Yes, we have. No, we, ha we, we have a quota for women. You mean in the, yes, in, our, in the Congress, yes. Yes, yes, we used that. What is it? It was. Yes. 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 <laughs> no, but I, I think at the first, the first, uh, the first law before it was amended, there was a quota. Yes, remember? To, yes, and then they. Yes, they. Yes, they changed it, but but now they are having more. I think we, you know, that we have about how many? Thirty. Thirty-three. Thirty-three. In the Congress, which is, I think, uh, is a good, good, good number in, in our I, affirmative action. You you ask about affirmative action that you, have, you ask yeah. about affirmative action. Yes. Yes. I th I, I think we will will will. We'll have that in future, inshallah. We'll have that. We should talk later. Yes, inshallah, <laughs> inshallah, inshallah. Um, <clears throat> By the way, talking about the ruins, you know what, what these extremists are planning to do? Is to destroy them. This is a threat, real threat to, to yes. Time for one last question in the second row here. Dr. Mgarif, Jamer Gari, Mustathmer Libya, Amriki. Ahlu wa sahlu. Sharif Kabir, to see you here. It's one of the happiest days of my family's life anyway, Thank you. I know that. Thank you, I'm going to give you a break from all the political questions that you've been fielding. <laughs> um, my question is about people of the Libyan American diaspora, such as ourselves. We've always remained very connected to our country. We go back all the time. I'm in Libya every two months at this point. I was at an event with uh, Dr. Mursi of Egypt yesterday where he was appealing to the Libyan diaspora, which is, of course, much, much bigger than ours, to come back, uh, excuse Egyptian. me, often. Egyptian, <laughs> yes, Egyptian <I> diaspora, <laughs> to either come back, and if you don't come back, send people back, and if you don't send people back, send money back. <laughs> we don't need money, but it seems to me, as 
I mean, an Masrafi and also an investor in my own, with my own family money, that we do need to be bringing some of our brain drain back. Because many of us, for example, people like yourself, spend all that time overseas. What kind of movement are we seeing of people like us coming back, having faith in you know, the system that security will return, et cetera, et cetera? I don't need convincing. I've been going back all the time. But what about our brothers and sisters who are still not convinced yet? Thank you. I think one of the good phenomena that took place after the, since the revolution started, hundreds of Libyans went back to Libya and fought for their country. Some of them were born here in, in the States and died, never seen Libya, and they died for Libya. Yes, they died in it. So, but what, what happened after was majority of them, because of the conditions that do exist now, because they are accustomed to living in, in the West, uh, security and otherwise, even comfort, comfort and uh, services, and lack of services there inside, they decide to go back and continue their, their life, waiting for conditions to, Im to improve in, uh, in Libya. I understand this. Because some, if I'm a father, I have kids. I want uh, to secure good education for them. I can't secure it for them in Libya. Then I might ask them to to stay out, to return back here. And uh, uh, but again, uh, I, while I respect this, but I encourage, I encourage uh, uh, all Libyans to 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 go back to their country and participate in its rebuilding. Because the country needs us all, need, need you all. I, I know that you have to have uh, to pay some sacrifice to to, end, to endure. Uh, I mean, a lot of uh, sufferings and all this. But this is our country. Small price. Small price. Small price. It has to. Mm -hmm. But we have no choice but to to, to do this. So, thank you. Thank uh, you for the center. Mr. President, I just say in closing uh, that. Uh, here at the Institute, here in this society, we have spent a good deal of time watching uh, with such hope and passion from a distance the Arab awakening. Uh, I'm sitting here next to a Libyan president who is taking questions, being criticized, being critiqued, um, able to comment back. And I'm thinking, what a, what a thrilling achievement that is for your society. And of course, that achievement is embodied by you. So I want to tell you, it's a great honor to have had you here. I, I'm sure I speak for the entire room when I send. We send you off uh, with so much backing for the mission you're on right now. Congratulations. Thank you so much.